like to welcome our uh, second panel joining us today. Starting on, on uh, my left, we have uh, Dan McDonald, Chief Executive of McDonald Estates, Gordon McIntyre Kemp, who's Chief Executive of Business for Scotland, Jim McCall, who's the uh, Founder, Chairman and Chief Executive of Clyde Blowers Capital, and Mary Macklin, who's Chief Executive of the Clin Group. Welcome to you all. Um, can I just remind uh, colleagues, we are, we are obviously a little bit short on time this morning, so people can keep their questions short and to the point. And uh, we've got quite a large panel, so I think rather than you know, everybody try and answer every question, um, if I'd ask people to direct the question at particular panel members, and then if you want to come in to respond to, to a question addressed to somebody else, we just catch my eye and I'll bring you in as time allows. And obviously if we can keep uh, responses as, as short as possible, that would be very helpful in terms of getting through the, the topics in the time available. Can, can I maybe just start by asking uh, all of you, maybe just start with Dan McDonald and work our way around. Um, Scotland currently uh, is doing well. The Scottish economy uh, is the uh, most successful part of the UK economy outside of London and the South East. Why do we need to be independent if we're doing so well? Well, I think it's the world that's changing at an unprecedented rate. And uh, we've got to become aware, uh, much more aware than we are, uh, of our place within the globe rather than uh, the British Isles. Um, the, the, the change is unprecedented um, and we have to plan for a way forward. As you say, Scotland's a wealthy country. I don't see um, the point that the previous speakers uh, were making. That I, was point, I was picking up on this, that under independence, everybody's going to go to London. London has a population of... Uh, I, I can't remember what it is, 8.5 million, uh, and it's growing very substantially. The cost of property down there is three times what it is here, and it's growing daily. So I'm afraid um, I would take issue with uh, those uh, who claim that uh, they were based themselves in London. London's not everything. Um, it is, though, uh, this London-centric um, economic uh, problem that we have uh, that drives me in part. Um, we benchmark ourselves, too, uh, with uh, the, the rest of the UK. Far better that um, we take that global view and start benchmarking ourselves with uh, other economies in the world, and we'll find then where we, where we really sit. Uh, I believe that in a smaller community, uh, we're going to get there faster. We're going to be able to streamline what we can do. I believe that um, the only way forward is to have a far more collaborative a society in which business, the community, uh, the public sector, government and the third sector, whoever, can work together, get rid of those silos and we can do that, as is evident from the very fact that I'm sitting here today uh, in government, which um, is a first for me. Um, it's not government, this is just the parliament. <laughs> okay, I take your point, Martin. <laughs> Um, we've got the potential too, and I don't think we realise just the depth of potential we have um, to apply ourselves to that uh, export-related growth um, that, that, that um, we've all looked at figures on. Mr McIntyre Kim. Um, well, first of all, I welcome your um, comments on uh, Scotland's success. Uh, we are a wealthy nation. Uh, we're just not a wealthy society because the wealth we create does not necessarily stay here and is not necessarily reinvested in Scotland. Um, for quite a few years now, Scotland's economic growth has actually tailed behind the rest of the UK. Since devolution, the um, gifting of some powers and some more authority to, to Scotland, we've actually seen a change in Scotland's fortunes. And I believe that if a little power... Um, makes a small difference, then a lot of power could potentially make a big difference. Now, it's not so much what I think, but what my members think. And Business for Scotland uh, has now 1,500 members uh, who are all businesses, business owners, sorry, uh, entrepreneurs and directors of businesses that operate in Scotland. Um, and 100 per cent of our membership is pro-independence. They have signed a declaration that says that we believe that Scotland becoming an independent uh, country will give us the tools to create a better Scotland, one that is more confident, uh, more international, more entrepreneurial, more successful, and more um, ambitious than the country we have right now. So there is a growing uh, consensus uh, within the SME sector of the, the, of the business community that we represent uh, that says that independence is actually more of an opportunity. 
Um, the main uh, thrust of my evidence uh, already, uh, or Business for Scotland's evidence uh, already uh, sent in and what I'll be talking about today, is that Scotland can, because it is a wealthy nation, if we keep the money in Scotland, easily afford to be an independent nation. Um, our economic growth has actually been held back uh, by having to pay £64,000 million servicing the interest of the UK's debt, which if you take that £64,000 million over the last 32 years out of our accounts, Scotland would actually not be in deficit right now. In fact, even accounting for all the things that the UK paid for, nuclear weapons we probably wouldn't have had leaving those in the accounts, we would have at least a uh, £50,000 million surplus right now. Uh, that research has been uh, peer-reviewed uh, by uh, other think tanks as well. So basically, uh, we believe that Scotland has actually been subsidising the UK, and the fact we've not been reinvesting in Scotland means that our economic growth, our opportunities for our communities, for our families and our businesses has been damaged. Um, as a result, uh, we are seeing more and more businesses uh, swap to supporting independence when they have the full facts, which most do not yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr McCall. Yeah, um, I suppose to begin with, I wasn't really pushing for independence. I was pu pushing for more powers for the Scottish Parliament, more fiscal powers, and I can't understand why anyone wouldn't want that. I know it's a business, um, and when I was developing my career, I wanted to be in charge of a profit centre, not a cost centre. You're more in control of your own destiny. Um, and I feel that we don't have the fiscal powers to make the best of economic growth in Scotland. And I think we are way behind in economic growth in achieving the potential we could. And also, um, you know, we've got too, too high a level of uh, joblessness. We need to create more jobs, create more private businesses. And to do that, we need to attract private businesses here. Those attracting private businesses here is what will create the wealth to allow us to fund the the progress, the social progress that we all want. And we don't have the powers to attract businesses up here. London is fantastic. It's a huge ma magnet. The infrastructure there, the money that's spent on infrastructure, um, the economic policies that are decided by Westminster are heavily weighted towards it, probably quite rightly. But there's, if you go outside of London... Um, it's not just a Scottish issue, it's a, 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 the regions of the UK. And um, we have an opportunity here to get more powers for the Parliament. You know, it's been, pill it's been um, billed as SNP by the no voters. Um, this isn't an SNP issue. This is a, an issue to give the Scottish Parliament more powers to decide its own destiny and to run the country in a way that suits the, the Scotland more. The issues in Scotland are quite different from the issues that face London and the South East. And I think the Parliament needs those powers to address those issues. Um, and the only way to do that is to get the additional powers that you need is to vote yes, because there's nothing been put forward by the No campaign. It's the status quo. And I, I don't think that hacks it. Another 15, in the past 15 years, doing the same as we've done in the past 15 years for the next 15 and thinking that you're going to get something different, I think is delusional. And why any politician in the Scottish Parliament of any political persuasion would not want to have more control over what happens in their own nation, I, I, it, it beats me. OK, thank you. Thank you very much um, for allowing us to speak here today at your meeting. Um, for me, I firmly believe a yes vote is the best for the people of Scotland and Scotland's future. Um, with my construction and development hat on, where 169,000 construction workers are employed, I feel if we had more full fiscal powers, we would be able to return a better deal for the construction industry. With my entrepreneurial hat on, um, where I closely work with companies like eSpark and Mentoring, um, we have 98% SMEs in Scotland, which is about 340,000. And again, with the limited powers that the Scottish Government have implemented in the likes of um, the EDGE Fund through Scottish Enterprise, which is aspiring and letting small businesses grow, I believe firmly with full fiscal policies where we can look at such things as um, VAT, airport transfer duty, 
um, aggregate tax, which should be devolved but isn't devolved currently, I firmly believe that the, the best future for Scotland is with independent powers. Okay, thank you all very much. Can I just ask a follow-up question before I bring in the, the Deputy Convener? Really picking up on what Dan MacDonald and, and Jim McCall both said um, about this point about you know, the London-centric economy, which is a point you know, quite a number of people have made. If, if that's the case, though, I'm wondering why you think that the, the preferred model of a currency union with the rest of the UK, which will just you know, see a continuance of that model, uh, is, is the preferred option. And, of course, we know that the rest of the UK has said, George Osborne, Ed Balls, Dan Alexander have said they don't support a currency union post-independence. But let's say there were a currency union. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be the case, as, as Mark Carney said in the speech three weeks ago in Edinburgh, that would require a substantial ceding of sovereignty? Is it conceivable, for example, that if there was a currency union, the rest of the UK would be happy to allow the junior partner in that currency union to, for example, cut corporation tax in Scotland, lower the rest of the UK? Surely that's not a model that's going to give us the, the fiscal freedom that both of you suggest that you want. Mr MacDonald. Well, cutting corporation tax is something that um, is important to me, but it's part of a, a national plan that uh, includes a lot of other things, including uh, what Jim mentioned there, infrastructure. I, I don't really see what the problem is about uh, the common currency. Um, in, in a hypothetical sense, um, th th there's no a threat uh, from George, George Osborne that we can't have the pound. It's absolute nonsense. And uh, it doesn't suit uh, businesses in England any more than it would in Scotland. So I see it as a a no-go area. There's, there's no discussion on it because uh, the call for Plan B is just to mess up what Alex Salmon said. Now, I don't care what Alex Salmon says. Um, I feel <laughs> that Scotland is a better place, led by Scottish business, uh, in that collaborative way that uh, I've been talking about. And uh, I can't say that the currency issue is a side issue, but it's something that we can sort out and quite confident about. But what about this point about the currency union, meaning there'd be very strict controls imposed on what Scotland can, can do? Well, we, we can live with that. The same as uh, we live with many other things. <laughs> Um, in, in a period of uh, transition. Who knows how, what, what happens in the future? If the Scottish economy thrives, as I would see it thriving, and as everyone would hope, maybe people south of the border would turn to us and look at us as an example uh, in leading a way forward. I don't see why not. Thank you. Mr McCall? Um, well, I, I don't see that it's a problem. I mean, the, um, the currency union and, and being tied with, to the Bank of England would still give you plenty of, of fiscal freedom. I don't see why it would stop you flexing tax policies. Um, that's going beyond what the Bank of England would do. They would set interest rates. They would maybe look at uh, borrowing levels that you couldn't go above. But it still gives you plenty of freedom to have the flexibility to design fiscal policies that would stimulate business growth and attract businesses into Scotland. So, for me, it's a non-issue. Okay. Briefly, Mr McTurkey. Uh, very briefly. First of all, the fact that you've asked the question, uh, would, under an official currency union, uh, would the rest of the UK be happy with Scotland varying the, the corporation tax, is an interesting question, because it would also suggest that they wouldn't be very interested in having us vary uh, corporation tax uh, as part of a devolved settlement either. Now, a lot of tax powers are actually moving to, to Scotland, or we're told are moving to Scotland as part of the, the, the 2012 uh, Scotland Act, but actually it's about 15% uh, of the, the, the tax varying powers. Uh, basically, there is a great deal of uncertainty as to whether there will be any more tax varying powers uh, coming to Scotland, because the, the, the unionist parties can't agree on an on a, uh, actual uh, statement on that. Um, the question about sovereignty as well, I think what happens is if Scotland actually uh, votes uh, yes, then we gain 100% sovereignty. What we can then do is decide to share uh, powers uh, with other nations through the EU, through uh, agreements uh, that are mutually beneficial. Uh, and we will always have the ability to change your mind at some point in the future. And, uh, but I don't see necessarily the divergence of Scottish economy uh, with the rest of the UK doing that in my lifetime, whereby uh, the divergence would be so much that we would decide uh, not to carry on uh, with Stirling. So sovereignty is 100% Scotland's, and it's our choice, our democratic choice, as to what we do with it afterwards. Okay. 
Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, it's probably a question to Mr. McCall, um, uh, because I think you know you were sort of suggesting that uh, initially you, you weren't sort of um, going down the, the yes road. Uh, I, I'm sort of wondering what sort of convinced you to go that road, and, and I'm also wondering if there was any truth in any of the the, the rumours or maybe it was speculation within the press that. Um, Westminster or the Better Together had they approached you any time on anyone in the witnesses to uh, maybe try and convince you to uh, be part of the union or remain part of the union? Um, well, I think I've explained why I, I think yes is the only way that you're going to get more powers in the Scottish Parliament uh, because there are, there's no evidence or there's nothing being put forward to give you more powers. Um, in the no vote. And I think we need more powers to be able to stimulate growth, to create more jobs, to deal with poverty and deal with the welfare issues that we have, um, stimulate growth in, in businesses. Um, and yes, I was asked uh, by Better Together, I was invited down to 10 Downing Street to discuss uh, the issues. And, and I did make the same statement there that I said, if you think saying vote no and um, we'll do something later, then uh, that's not going to fly. And the answer I got back was, you're right, we'll need to do something about that. But I haven't seen anything being done about it. OK, any, anyone else been... Want to any other approach by Better be, Together? Been approached by Better Together? No. <laughs> it would appear not. It would appear not. Sorry, we'll go for you, Mr McCall. Uh, I, I'm, I'm wondering, we, we spoke to the other panel and uh, there was quite a, a lot of discussion about uh, Europe and, you know, I, I was asking the question if, um, a, if the UK were to leave Europe, what would that mean uh, to, to their businesses? Um, in the event of a yes vote, um, do you believe that Scotland will be much in a much stronger place uh, uh, as an independent country in Europe and if the rest of the UK leave Europe at a later date? we're going to be in a much stronger position without them. Mr MacDonald. Well, it's a very difficult one. Um, I feel that very strongly that we should remain a part of Europe, <coughs> and that's, that's where my thought process uh, stops. Um, I, d I don't think, uh, I don't think uh, Britain are doing the right thing in departing. Or, or suggesting that uh, departing from Europe might be a good thing. Um, it's, it's more about consolidation uh, of countries globally uh, than it is uh, leaving uh, a broad uh, economic uh, forum uh, such as that. I'd, I don't see a problem if Scotland stays in uh, the UK, in, the, in Europe and uh, England depart. Well, it'll lead to... A, the very difficulties that um, are being projected by this, are these arguments about currency and whatever other things, cross-border things there may be, but um, I really don't see it as being a big issue. I think it's uh, sidetracking the main issue, uh, which we have to debate between now and uh, September. Thank you for that. Mr McCall, you got a view on that? On the Europe issue? On the Europe yes, issue. yes. Um, um, you know, I, I think uh, what David Cameron has proposed is, is, is very good, that we need to negotiate um, a different stance with Europe in, in the UK because there's too much being decided by non-elected people in Brussels. So I think there needs to be a change there. So I'm supportive of what they're trying to do, and, um, but I, I'm also quite supportive of staying in Europe. I've got a number of businesses across Europe um, you know, it's a common market. We have no issues trading with each other, trading with the UK. Although there's different currencies between Europe and the UK, uh, it doesn't it doesn't pose a problem for us, and I would be very supportive of staying in. Um, I think uh, what it does do is it gives us a second bite of the cherry if um, if something goes wrong uh, when it goes to a referendum in the UK and they vote out. At least we've got a chance. Even if we have to negotiate to get in, we've, we've got a chance to get to get in. Although I don't think we would, it the, it would be as big a problem as is being portrayed in the press. This negotiating to get back in. Thank you. Okay. Dan McDonald wants to come back in very, very quickly. Very briefly. 
I remember 20 years ago, uh, when I went to Brussels a lot, uh, I bumped into Irish people everywhere. Um, there were no Scots um, attached to uh, the, the EU, and they were all there with a brief to get as much money out of Europe and get it back to Ireland <laughs> and spend it in infrastructure. And you go to Ireland nowadays and see the quality of the infrastructure is there. I'm very, very envious that we've got nothing like it. Yeah. Okay, Marie, Marie Macklin wants to come in. I would um, basically say it's very important to us in, in Scotland and myself as a business that we remain in, in the EU. And I know in speaking to other business people, the concerns that they currently have is the, the risk from the UK government with that in-out potential referendum. I think, you know, we've heard the spin um, and I was actually pleased to see Bernard Pons in his interview with um, the Prime Minister, where he is now absolutely backing us um, that should we become independent, he will um, back us in our application. I think the logic in the EU is the EU is all about enlargement, not creating barriers. And for me, um, Scot the Scots people want to remain in the EU. We're very positive the EU. Um, it's, not in the, it's not in the EU's self-interest um, to say no to Scotland um, because we're a very wealthy country and there actually is legal framework there that before a referendum takes place prior to Scotland's independence we can actually become a member thereafter so I think from a business person's point of view a lot of SMEs um, are concerned about the, the constant spin on currency and EU I think it's about time we actually start listening to what's in the book I mean this book here is an open book for the people of Scotland to review um, it, it's not on tablets of stone, it's for the business community to sit and actually discuss it and the small SMEs to discuss it. So I'm 100% behind that we should remain in the EU. Wait, briefly, Mr McIntyre, Kim. Very quickly, uh, we've surveyed our members and 99% of our members wish to uh, remain uh, within the EU. So businesses uh, overall are very keen to stay in the, the EU. There's a commitment from the Conservative Party uh, to, if they win the next election, uh, which many uh, commentators are saying looks more likely, uh, that there will be an in-out of the EU, yet some people may disagree with that, I'll accept, uh, that there will be an in-out of the EU referendum. Now, in Scotland, there is a majority for staying. Uh, I've seen polls that show that in the rest of the UK, where we're massively outnumbered, there's a majority for leaving. I think that there are no guarantees with a no vote of staying in the EU. I think everyone must accept that. So there's a great deal of uncertainty about Scotland's continued EU membership if we actually uh, vote no. Uh, the other thing is I don't necessarily think we'll, ha we'll be outside and have to reapply. Um, having looked at this, I think we'd have to have a referendum in order to leave. There are varying um, uh, opinions on this, uh, but what I would actually say is that the UK government has the ability to ask for clarification. Scotland does not, because it's not a member. So if the UK government wants to clear up certain issues, as it has said it does on currency, then let's also have the UK government ask for an official ruling on Scotland's status so that the Scottish people can go to the referendum with a clear answer. Thank you, convener. We heard from the previous business panel about uh, the uncertainty that the referendum is causing for their businesses and the impact on investment and jobs. As business people yourself, is this something that concerns you, this uncertainty? I don't see it. Um, I don't see the whole of Scottish business, but um, my life has been connected to a commercial property development, which is uh, our... Uh, offices, retail and uh, industrial property. And um, there's, there's a nervousness, of course, among people um, who get up in the morning, put their kids to school and then go and get out or, or have to get planes to London where they're based. Um, Why is there a nervousness, I'll, Mr MacDonald? Because they don't want change. Simple as that. They don't want their lives to change and they're not interested in uh, what they're doing here as much as what they can generate in bonuses and fees uh, from a London base. So their so view is that business is better as it is in the union? Pardon? Their view is that the current constitutional settlement is better for business? They don't really have a view. They just have a view that uh, they don't want change. Um, that apart, um, we saw a report uh, uh, at the end of 2012 um, which said that uh, independence, the debate on independence was a great problem because <clears throat> it was uh, an, it, it, a very prominent uh, agency um, where London based, but 
uh, represented here said that it was undermining confidence and uh, their, figures, their figures were down. This year, they're about to announce they've had a record year. That same company have had a record year. They've no worries about independence, or at least they're not uh, talking about them. So I've got to interpret that as um, the independence issue being used as an excuse because their figures had dropped. Now, there's issues like that out there. Otherwise, um, I meet these guys day to day uh, in the pub and the club and the, for lunch, and I do not see, I do not see from my heart, I do not see a great deal of concern about it. When they go to London, they've got a different agenda. I mean, the previous uh, panel, mis panelist Mr Kilgour cited the referendum as the reason for delaying two investments. Well, I mean, I, is, is that an excuse he's I, making? That, it could be. It could be. I'm not sure. The, it's, that does happen. There's, I've seen that happen before. I don't know what he's talking about there. I don't know what the investments are. So um, I'm, I'm not here to suggest that uh, uh, that's the case. Um, but it's a bit more complicated than just uh, the simple issue that uh, those gentlemen talked about. Uh, in the same way as relocating to London is a very complicated matter because the costs are enormous. And I don't really know where they're going to go because the London market's uh, exploding anyway. Um, I'd be interested in the, a couple of the other panelists yeah, on that. Yeah. Can I, I'm quite happy to answer. Um, I mean, I think from my point of view, with the, the, the three hats on and being in construction development and working with entrepreneurs and um, board member of Ayrshire, um, the New Ayrshire College, um, I would like to answer it in that capacity. But I think it's worth noting this morning that actually New Start Businesses in Scotland has been announced today at 30,263 which is up from 2010 from 20,700. So there's an air of confidence there in the SME market. But from an enterprise and entrepreneur's point of view, what people are looking for in growth, and when I meet people, um, women in the Ayrshire Association of Business Women or Scottish Business Women, these are the people that are driving the economy. And I don't see any fear there other than keeping driving and entering competitions like the Edge Fund through the Scottish Government to drive forward their businesses. I think as well, you know, the, the, there have been issues with the fund for lending scheme, as the Federation of um, Master Builders has said, you know, again, um, the, the uncertainty there is, is what would happen if we remain in, in the UK regarding um, taxation, VAT issues. We would have the, the, the chance here with independence to actually look at the full fiscal policies to help SMEs. So I don't see fear from an SME's point of view. I think from construction and development point of view, I think if you go along the M8 just now and you actually look up to St Vincent Street, you'll see there's cranes. And where there's cranes, there's actually investment. And where there's investment, there's money and there's jobs. And you've got a new HQ for um, the Scottish uh, Power. And across the road, you've got a huge new private sector development currently being built by a national company. And I think I want to leave it with Ayrshire College and the students. Um, the business students there and the social science students um, have um, took the bull by the horns and had their own indie ref debate. And this is the future, the young people, the people who will drive Scotland's economy. And at the start of that debate, they said that 50% wanted to remain in the UK, 33% saw the best opportunity was independent Scotland, and 17 were undecided. At the end of the debate, it was 46% yes, 43% no, and 11% undecided. These are the young folk with I, you can attitude that can change Scotland based on a prosperous nation. These are the brickies the bakers, the child cares, the engineers, the accountants that have every confidence in an independent nation. I have the details of a poll from Scotland on Sunday uh, from 1997, which said that 76% of businesses believe that devolution will harm the economy. I remember being told that uh, businesses were going to leave Scotland, that all the banks would relocate. It's funny, it's the exact same companies now are saying exactly the same thing now, uh, or people are saying the same thing about the same companies. I've heard it all before. Um, in terms of uh, uncertainty, 
as I say, I think there's as much uncertainty with the no vote as there is with a the yes vote. But actually, we were told that foreign direct investment would actually slow down as just as a result of holding the referendum. Well, actually, people have been signing 25, 30-year leases on property, and actually, foreign direct investment, uh, the last Ernst & Young survey, uh, we had a record year of numbers of projects, etc. So, that, so there's actually very little evidence of this. And the same businesses that you might think are a bit unsure that Dan said don't want change for their own sake, not for the nation's sake, but for their own sake, those same businesses will complain if there was more power suggested because they just don't want change. So I don't think that there's any real worry here because the businesses didn't leave after devolution and I don't think they're going to leave after independence. Okay. I'll bring Jenny Mara back in one pinch. I'll just say we are, we are short on time this morning. We have to sharpen up quite a bit, I'm afraid, on, on some of the responses because we're not going to get through this. I know Jim McCall's got a plane to catch this morning. Mr McCall. Um, well, it's this afternoon. So <laughs> um, you need to leave this morning, don't you? Um, uh, you know, I've got, um, I think it's 42 investors, uh, most of which are from overseas, two, two thirds from the US, the rest from Europe, and I think I've got two in Scotland. They're, I'm seeing no, um, no nervousness with them at all. In fact, we were twice oversubscribed in the last fund, which was just recently, and we've we've got huge. Is there experience? That's, that's businesses that want to invest Lack of into investment Scotland. doesn't concern you, Mr. McCall. No, no, no. Because well, we heard from the panel earlier that it's a real concern and that investment has been delayed. As a businessman in Scotland, does that not concern you for our economy? No, I'm talking about people are talking about Robert Kilgore, for example. He's talking about a small project that he's delaying. He's also influenced. You know, Robert. He said two major projects he, uh -huh. he Ro delayed. Rob Robert did say that they're going ahead. He's holding off on them just now. But it could He's be the one that could put it forward. Um, it I'm will have an impact I'm on investment and jobs. Does that not concern you about our economy? What I am concerned about our economy, that's why I want to vote. I, I want the vote to be yes to get more powers because people that I talk to, the investors I talk to, are keen to see what happens here, but they're not concerned about the outcome because they're still going to invest. It's not going to turn them off. And these are people that are going to invest large sums, much larger than what Robert was talking about. Okay. Well, it's very hard to raise money. Isn't it, uh, Jim, for any project just now, and it's easy to find excuses uh, not to do them or delay them. It's symptomatic of uh, where the economy is. I find that an interesting answer, Mr MacDonald, because the SNP members are always telling us that the, the, the economy is improving and that we have record investment. So for you to say that that's an excuse. Yes, well, that's the okay, evidence. Okay, okay. okay, my second question is you were all... We were, right, I think, I, I really think we... we that'll be we very need, short, convener. Well, I'll, right, okay, if we get very short answers, but come on. Okay, you were all very pro-membership of the European Union as an independent Scotland. I think there is recognition that when we apply or go through the process of going into the European Union as an independent country, we will not get the same conditions. It's the reality of every political negotiation, as I'm sure you know you negotiate all the time. So can the panel tell me which of the three opt out of the euro, the rebate and Schengen that they would be prepared to forfeit for a Scottish independent country to enter the European Union? That's, that's a false assumption, I'm afraid. Uh, it's entirely possible that we can end up with more opt-outs. Uh, Denmark is a small nation of a similar size. It has five opt-outs. The UK has but three. it's a member of the European we Union. Have, we have. Uh, so, is, so is Scotland, and there is absolutely no mechanism other than us having a referendum and agreeing to leave that would actually technically take it out. I've said before, this, the UK Parliament should ask... Uh, for a clarification on this. So you're asking us a negative question. The answer is that Scotland has a great deal of negotiating power uh, in terms of renegotiating our continued uh, membership. Uh, the sea that we control, the oil revenues, etc. Uh, it would be ridiculous with 26% of the uh, renewable capacity uh, of the EU to say that we don't have a strong hand so in renegotiating. So you're saying we'll get everything that we want in that negotiating process? I, no, you're saying that we definitely no, wouldn't. I, I'm saying that there's a possibility we'll right, actually okay, get more. Okay, we get the point. Right. Okay. Somebody else want to pick that question up? Mr McCall? Well, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think it's uh, that's kind of like... Um, uh, it's, it's a question that uh, it's not a question. It's trying to make a point that these are issues. They're not issues. But they're up for negotiation. Um, I think that uh, we will be able to go in. And there's one thing that 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 uh, you know I object to that's been that's bandied about a lot on the no campaign. 
We're withdrawing from the UK. We're not part of the UK. We're not British anymore. We will be part of the UK because it's the United Kingdom, which is the union of the crowns. The Queen will still be the head. We're separating the parliaments. We had a United Kingdom 103 years before we had a United Parliament. So, you know, this is all sort of scaremongering uh, rhetoric that's thrown about coming out of the UK. We're not coming out of the UK. And it's very unique. We're in a very unique position compared to anybody else in Europe because we will remain with the same head of state after we devolve the parliament. Yeah. Right. Okay, we need to move on because otherwise we're going to run out of time. Um, Alison Johnson. Thank you, convener. Um, Ms Macklin, in your submission, you note that a constructive case has been made to, uh, for the reduction of VAT on repairs, a case that's been repeatedly ignored by Westminster government and you know, is one that I've been contacted on by the construction industry, by architects. You know, it, it certainly, there's no incentive at the moment for repair and maintenance um, and I think that's a great shame. We have a lot of hard-to-treat properties in Scotland when it comes to insulation and so on. But a member of the earlier panel suggested that his approach would simply be to continue lobbying the Westminster government on the issues that were important to him. Um, but Mr McCall noted that you, know, you can't keep doing the same thing and expect to achieve a different outcome. So is it simply the case that it's impossible for Scottish businesses to optimise conditions for business without independence. Um, as I said earlier, um, if, if you read Scotland's Future book, this is an open book for the people of Scotland from all different sectors to put their opinion across on what would be best for Scotland regarding the fiscal powers that Scotland have, regarding all forms of taxation. The VAT is a very... Um, it's very close to my heart because being a regeneration company specialist of listed buildings, mm -hmm. we've seen in October uh, 2012 that relief, um, zero relief withdrawn and put back to standard rate. Now, that equates to 350,000 properties in the UK being affected on regeneration in town centres and city centres. It affects the construction industry, um, where we could be accelerating the process of repairs and renewals in buildings and creating more jobs in the construction industry. People have pulled, you know, have pulled back. The actual Federation um, of Small Builders in their survey um, they actually have said that they are looking, 43% of them are looking to put prices up. Um, they are looking at the fact that they would, um, they've been lobbying for a VAT reduction to 5% from 20%. Now, the revenue actually gained £85 million from that listed building change, which to me is just not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And I think what the appalling thing was, the Telegraph actually printed that when the Chancellor put that um, tax in place, he was aiming at the work in private homes with historic value um, where millionaires were installing swimming pools. Well, I'm sorry, there ain't many swimming pools in Colmarnock or in Ayr. Um, that tax is a direct tax in the construction industry and homeowners and small business owners. And I think if you look at to the, the Irish model, I mean, they, they have basically um, come up with scenarios to help the construction industry. Um, and I have put it in my paper, the Living City Initiative, which... On all buildings, they're given 7 to 10 year capital allowances, tax allowances back to people who do repairs, which will actually in turn benefit the construction industry. And they're actually saying they'll hopefully gain 5,500 jobs. With independence and our own tax raising <coughs> powers, we can look at driving that economy and gaining more income from the Treasury and getting people back to work, women back to work um, and through childcare provisions. So. I firmly believe that's why I'm so passionate about um, a yes vote for me. Thanks. Um, that was a very helpful response. I'd appreciate hearing similar examples from our other witnesses, uh, convener. If, if they would be very brief about it, that would be helpful. If they have anything you want to add, if not, we can use them very on. quick uh, yeah. example. Uh, 21 out of 28 EU nations have actually reduced the VAT rate on hotels to boost tourism, uh, something that Business for Scotland would support uh, as well. Ireland reduced uh, with a 21%, 21.5% standard VAT rate. They charged 9% on restaurants, hotels, and tourist attractions. The idea is that. Not all uh, tax reductions actually reduce the overall tax take, because what happens is that if you reduce air passenger duty and you reduce uh, hotel tax, etc., we get more people coming to Scotland and they'd spend more money in Scotland, uh, and uh, the overall tax take would go up. So the simple idea of if you raise taxes, you get more money, 
Well, you don't. If you raise the, 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 there are certain uh, thresholds. That if you go above, people stop buying that product or that's related to it. So I think there's a very strong example here of where uh, air passenger duty, uh, corporation tax, VAT, they've not been devolved uh, to Scotland. I personally don't believe they will be devolved to Scotland uh, in the event of a no vote, because if you did, that would give Scotland an economic advantage over the rest of the UK, and London does not want that. Okay, thank you. Right, okay. Thank you. Um, right, okay, I'll bring in Christian Allard. Thank you very much, Convener, and thank you for coming this morning. Um, just leaning on this and talking about a successful Scotland, because we are a successful and rich nation, and we expect with a yes vote to be a more successful and, and uh, uh, nation a prosperous nation. But uh, we heard from the last panel that there will be some concern about uh, skill shortages, and particularly I'm a member from the Northeast, and we have skill, skill shortages there. So I've seen that in the white paper there is a lot of debate, and we heard from Ms. Uh, McLean about it, about childcare, which we could uh, help uh, uh, participation of women into, into the workforce. Uh, uh, so what, what other things would you see that we could help boost the work, the working age population? Particularly, we heard from Mr. Kilgo who said earlier that he would like to see uh, immigration policies to be devolved. Uh, do you think we can have a different uh, uh, policy on this? Mr. McIntyre? I, th I think um, the, the point about uh, a collaborative a society is important because um, there's a lack of engineers in the northeast because we didn't see forward uh, properly. But if if we can, um, within a national plan, become truly collaborative and get away from uh, the voices of industry, the CBI and and the likes, uh, and have like they have in Germany. Um, and uh, people working within uh, a collaborative uh, environment, then there'll be fewer uh, uh, job, loss, job uh, gaps in various industries if it's planned properly. That doesn't answer the whole question. Um, I, th I think from my point of view, um, with an enterprise hat on, um, the way you create jobs is by creating entrepreneurs, and there's plenty of entrepreneurs out there. I mean, there's 340,000 small businesses that employ 1.1 million people in this country. But again, going back to the the fiscal um, powers that we have, I, I would look at the, at the Irish model in the budget of 2014. They have come up with some fantastic ideas to encourage enterprise and create jobs. Um, and if, for a, a couple of examples, if you want me to explain some of them to you, I mean, you have got, for example, in the Irish budget, the SYOB scheme, and that was purposely to encourage unemployed people to start up their own businesses with giving them tax breaks. We have got... Um, at UK government level, certain um, offerings, so to speak, um, through EIS relief, etc. But these are aimed at people with money, people that have got you know, money in the back pocket to invest in businesses. What we need to look at is the growth of small businesses. In Ireland, we've got the Home Renovation Scheme, which is hitting, it's getting two turns. The Home Renovation Scheme is, again, for people who want to work from home, getting capital allowances and tax breaks for a two-year period to reinvest that money back into home repairs, which in turn helps the construction industry. And one that was really important, I felt, was the seed capital um, scheme. And that was people who had been made unemployed um, or had chose to move on under pay gel and they'd pay tax. If they actually start up their own business, they get six years exemption from tax and get refunds back. That's how you grow an economy um, and create jobs. And for me, that's what I believe independence could bring, because the UK government have had the opportunities to give us varied schemes. And you know, I can refer you back to what Federation Small Builders are saying. These schemes aren't working. The funding for lending ain't working. Um, there's bias towards the construction industry. So independence would, again, let us bring all this together and roll out new models. Hundreds of thousands of people have left Scotland as economic immigrants uh, to the rest of the UK. My own family, I was brought up in the northeast of England. Uh, I'm the only person that's actually come back uh, from my family, I think. Uh, I have cousins all over the world uh, who've moved to Australia, uh, New Zealand, etc. Um, I actually think that with the powers of independence, we can start growing our country at the same rate as just the, even the average rate of 
uh, small independent European countries would have meant that our country would be 30% uh, larger, sorry, our, our economy would be 30% larger than it is today uh, over the last, um, uh, since 1963. Uh, so basically, uh, I think the migration to, the, to Scotland, people coming to live in Scotland, will actually not necessarily be immigrants from all over the world. I think the vast majority will be people coming back from uh, England, Wales, uh, Northern Ireland and, and, and Ireland, uh, where we already have open borders. I think that would be uh, where the majority of the immigration would come from. But can I just quickly point out that the University College London has done some uh, work on this and found out that immigrants from within the, the European economic area bring a 45% relative surplus. They earn more, they're more highly qualified, etc. That can allow us to grow our businesses and that means we can create more employment uh, as well. So basically, as Scotland grows, we'll need more people. And as more people come and they start having families here, it will change the demographics and it will really paint a much better picture for our economy if we can actually get immigration right. Uh, just very quickly on the um, looking at welfare, which is not a devolved issue. Um, I've been involved chairing a group in Glasgow in Welfare to Work. And what happens is an initiative comes out from... Um, the Westminster government, which is a good initiative to help people, but you have to 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 give the support to, to create to help build the skills in the people. Um, you have to be able to bid to manage this contract, and to be able to bid, you have to be able to deliver it nationally. So you you get someone who's based down south bids for it because no one in Scotland delivers it nationally. Um, they can't deliver it in Scotland, so they subcontract it to someone in Scotland. They have to take their fees off that money to cover their costs in managing it. It then gets devolved to someone in Scotland who can't deliver it in all the areas, who again subcontracts it. At the end of the day, 40% of the money that was assigned to that to develop skills doesn't get to the people it needs to get to. So this is a clear issue where you know devolving welfare... Um, as a, you know, as, as as one of the topics would be uh, would be a positive thing, and just one other issue that skills development is separate from job centre plus. Yeah. We have duplicate facilities in in most towns where we're not allowed to share data. You know, you you can't go and find out the people who need the help from job centre plus. You have to then spend more money through skills development, which is not going in to the end development of the skills. It's, 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 uh, you know, it's nuts the way it's set up, and we need to streamline that so that it's all delivered end to end. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Mr. Allard. We've got four members left who want to ask questions, and we've got about 15 minutes left. So um, uh, we'll need to be quite sh short, if we can, on the, uh, on the responses. Marco Piaggi. Just ask one question then, and that is the, the same question I asked before uh, to the last panel. Do you believe that successive UK governments have done enough to enhance gender, uh, gender participation, female participation in particular in business, um, both at the, the start-up level and at, at higher echelons? No, they haven't. Um, we need to do more. <laughs> Next. <laughs> That's my answer. <laughs> the, the majority of uh, the for Scotland city leaders are actually female. That's the only thing I'll just add in there, but I agree. No, they haven't. OK. Marie Macklin. I, I would say no, they haven't. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I'm a member of Ayrshire Business Association, the Scottish Business Women Association, and this topic has been discussed for Davos, for, for Dundee to Davos, and the UK government's position is on they don't believe in quotas. European Union recently have set a 40% quota um, for 2020. Um, there has been various to and throwing um, at a national level. We now see that Angela Merkel has set a 30% quota for 2016. And we even have Christian Lagarde now believing in quotas. And the Deputy First Minister here obviously has been recently stating about the quota issue. I think from a women's perspective, women want job and merit. Um, what we need to do is we need to get women into work. So I know when I speak to women um, at Ayrshire Business, they welcome the government's position on childcare provisions um, and an increase in that. Um, um, going forward, um, you know, the, I think it's interesting that in the, the FTSE 100, there only is 100, um, out of the 100 companies, there's only 17.3% employ women. Um, and there has been a statute put out that you have to put in your accounts 
who is mm -hmm. employed, etc., and that should be 25 per cent. Um, so for me, um, I think it, we just have to face reality, and the fact is that, um, yeah, I think a quota is required. Um, and maybe during that banking crisis, if we had um, more Lehman sisters than Lehman brothers, we wouldn't have actually faced the situation <laughs> that we were in. I did say one question, but do you believe that that level of improvement, both childcare and at board level, will be delivered by any UK government? been delivered to date, has it? So, I mean, I think looking forward, um, I can only refer back to what's in the book and what I hear out there in the streets from, from the women of Scotland. They welcome the 600 hours um, for childcare provision. They welcome the increase up to is it 1,500 hours, 1,400 hours, when um, we get independence in the first parliament. Okay. All right. Thank you. No, no I didn't think that. I think Mary Beth has covered that very well. Right. Um, Margaret McDougall. Thank you and good morning, panel. Um, I'm going to go back to the currency issue where um, Jim McCall mentioned earlier that he felt that businesses would deal with whatever currency that um, is decided upon. I mean, we've heard that there won't be a currency union and, and if you were just to go along with that and, you know, so the options are, you know, sterlingisation or another currency altogether. You said that you would be happy and businesses would work with whatever they were given. Well, and that would... Well, for a start, I, I don't think there's going to be an issue about having the pound. So I don't, I don't think it's an issue. But uh, in, in, you know, in the broader sense, we deal with a number of currencies in our businesses. You know, we deal between the UK just now and Europe with pounds, sterling and euros. We have absolutely no trouble with it. We, you know, I think uh, the the issue is being blown out of all proportion. Mm. Uh, we we have to deal with that um, uh, across our businesses. You know, different different currencies. So, do you not see that there would be additional transactional costs, for example, for businesses if there was a different uh, currency in Scotland? Well, you don't know. That doesn't. If, if you're a, a business that is dealing uh, out with the the UK and, you, and you've got businesses out with it, quite often you you don't have you can you can negate currency costs because you can balance it up between the different businesses. So there's not necessarily currency costs in doing something like that. If you're constantly dealing in the currency, then you can have an account with that currency, and you you don't need to take costs of it. You can have in your bank account a euro account, a dollar account, and a sterling account. You don't need to incur costs changing it back and forward all the time. Right. Does anyone else have a response to that? I, d I don't think um, it's an issue. I believe we'll end up with common currency if we see a yes vote. Um, but um, following on from what Jim's just said, Scottish businesses are going to have to deal with uh, many, many currencies and changes in currencies uh, more and more and more as we spread our wings uh, globally, which we have to do uh, to survive. I don't know how many countries you're in uh, now, Jim, but I, I know, for instance, uh, the Wood Group are in uh, 80 uh, different countries, and the Weir Group are in 50. I may have that the wrong way around. Um, so dealing with a currency issue is not a problem, but we don't have that problem anyway because we'll have a, co a common currency, I reckon. I, I always have three in my pocket. You know, there's no, <laughs> <laughs> no, not an issue. So you'd have, no, you'd have no issues with the Bank of England setting the interest rates? No, no, I think, um, you know, that's a financial discipline a fiscal discipline that we would want to stick with anyway. I think we're very well aligned with the, the rest of the UK in terms of productivity and um, our economy. So I don't think there would be a problem with uh, the interest rates being set by the Bank of England. Can I just uh, add in there that uh, the, the UK, as it is a common market, if you like, is an uh, optimum currency area. Uh, England on its own might not be. Scotland on its own might not be. It makes sense uh, for uh, us to share a currency, just as it makes sense for Belgium and Luxembourg to share a currency, for France and Germany to share a currency. Currency unions are, are not inherently difficult unless you allow the wrong countries in. 
and uh, people talk about Greece quite a lot. It's not because of the use of the euro, it's because of consistent failures in the management of Greece's finances, uh, chancellor after chancellor. Uh, so basically, we've, we've seen Deutsche Bank actually say that the UK is an optimal currency area. Citibank has agreed with that. Uh, businesses north and south of the border want it. The people uh, north and south of the border want it. So basically, we have a situation where it makes sense for everyone. You've also got to uh, ask the question that if it increases the possibility that Scotland would not uh, take on uh, a fair share of the UK's debt, on the balance of that, uh, the, the Vienna Convention suggests it's the principle of international law that guides uh, these negotiations. You take on a fair share of debt and a fair share of assets. If the assets are not given, then it's a principle that you would not take on the debt as well. Yes. Scotland's economy is about 10% of the UK. If we didn't take on the debt, then you'd see a 20% <coughs> rise uh, in the debt to GDP ratio uh, of the UK. That would potentially damage the UK's AAA rating. And it's not just business transaction costs. I think there'd be a serious worry about English homeowners not having uh, the mortgage rates that they currently have as well. So they could be the ones that would pay the folly uh, of not agreeing <coughs> to maintain the world's most successful currency union. Okay. need to move on because we're very short on time. Um, Chick Brody. Just following on from that, uh, <coughs> the point made by, by the convener at the beginning, we're always in great danger of conflating currency union and monetary union, which are not the same thing. Um, I wonder why I may ask Gordon uh, McIntyre Kemp. Oh, sorry, yes, good afternoon, good morning, uh, uh, lady and gentlemen. Um, UK has a trade deficit of about 35 billion. Scotland has a trade surplus of trade surplus of 6.3 billion. Our fiscal deficit is 2.3 percent of GDP. The UK is 6 percent of GDP. The uh, the a capital account that the UK has is $446 billion. It is a debt of $1.347 billion, going up to $1.74 billion. If, just, you bear with me, just assume we don't have a currency union, what do you think would happen to sterling and the rest of the UK on the basis of that figure? Remembering that uh, the Chancellor, Chancellor himself last week in Hong Kong said the UK needs to have, have a much more balanced economy and needs to export a lot more. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on that. The UK's economy uh, has gone through a process of deindustrialisation. It's not just Scotland and the west coast of Scotland in particular, I guess, that's uh, been damaged by that, but the rural areas as well. But also major parts of the rest of the UK, as I said, I was brought up in the northeast of England uh, as well. And I think that that policy was radically different to the one followed by Germany. Uh, who invested in uh, medium-sized uh, manufacturing firms, uh, SMEs, etc. And as a direct result, they've had a, a radically different uh, outcome. Uh, I think it's worked far better for them. In terms of the, the balance of payments, there's, uh, you know, I thought it was very interesting to hear uh, David Cameron uh, from the Olympic Stadium actually state uh, in his speech that uh, whiskey alone contributes £120 per second uh, to the UK balance of payments. And I think that there's an admission there that Scotland does uh, export a uh, significant amount uh, as well. I actually think it's a lot more than 120. I think uh, he actually used figures from uh, last year as opposed to the most recent ones, which is about 150, uh, I think. But um, uh, I, can, I can supply uh, details on that and uh, written evidence afterwards. Uh, but Scotland's exports are worth nearly 100 billion in 2012 alone. Um, and, uh, you know, whiskey, food and drink, these sort of things uh, are very important to that. The other thing is that, that the UK actually exports more to Scotland than Scotland export in, in percentage terms. So it actually uh, generates about £5,000 million pounds worth of goods and services across the border from the rest of the UK to, to Scotland. If we were to put barriers to that trade, then that would be the second largest and actually the most important uh, export market for the rest of the UK yep. could be damaged. And hundreds of thousands of jobs in England alone are dependent on that trade. Uh, that's why I believe there won't be any barriers to trade, why we'll maintain open borders, and also why we should maintain uh, the currency union as well, because it, it makes sense. It's in everyone's benefit. Absolutely. Right. One, one other question. One question uh, for uh, Jim, uh, Mr McCall, and uh, I've Mary. got nothing intelligent to add to that. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Moving on to the next question. Um, one of the, the comments made by the Sheffield... Um, Policy exchange research said that uh, because of the weakness of the UK economy, and it is weak, potential benefits to the UK economy have been squandered in favour of boosting financial services concentrated in London. 
after some research that, that I had done, we find that Scotland has one quarter of the population of London and the South East, yet spending on construction is public and private sector is one seventh. I mean, how the impact on Scottish raw material, raw material for building must be quite substantial. I mean, how do we suggest we address that? I, I'm, I didn't quite get the... What I'm saying is the, the construction. I mean, one of the points you made about a, a UK government policy which fails to recognise the importance of the construction industry and real upfront public investment. Well, let me put a question. Do you agree that the programme that we've engendered in terms of capital investment, particularly in construction, has created a situation where Scotland is now, a, next to London, a, a, a very impressive growth economy? I, I, I could just agree with you, yes. I've got nothing. That's all I wanted. <laughs> right, Marie. Um, obviously, construction close to my heart. Um, I think from a construction point of view, I would, I would take it back from the, the major construction companies to the small SMEs. Um, and I, I see and speak to a lot of them, um, especially some of the contractors that have done work for us. I mean, I think from a construction point of view, we need to take a serious look at the, the items like aggregate levy. Um, the aggregate level um, was meant to be devolved here, but due to the EU, EU court case just now, it's not. I mean, that was a levy that's affecting the construction industry that was meant to be an environmental tax levy. Um, but under um, the, the policy of the UK government, they actually changed how that levy would work. There was funds to go into um, a social sustainability fund, and due to the austerity measures, that was cancelled. So we now, again, have a, a basic tax. It's a tax in the construction industry, which creates jobs. So, again, for construction, 169,000 employees in Scotland, we would like to see issues of VAT being tackled. That I've explained earlier, we have VAT reduction. Federation of Small Builders has um, voiced their opinion to that to the UK government. Um, but nobody seems to be listening. All right, we need to move on. Uh, thank you, convener. It was a question for Mr Macdonald, because... I was quite intrigued by, in his written submission, um, the suggestion that there could be uh, some efficiency savings made from relocation of um, government departments, if you like, that we're currently paying for in Westminster, being relocated to property in Scotland after independence, uh, where property values, rentals and so on are much lower. And could you, could you just... Am I on the right track? Did I interpret what you were saying correctly? Yes. Just in case I give the wrong impression, I think we should be strengthening our conduit with London, by the way. So it's not a reflection on uh, um, rejecting run London. But it, it was very, very difficult. I got some people to look into this, and it was very, very difficult to get the, the statistics. And uh, what I've been saying is that um, the amount of space that's used uh, by UK government, and it's in a report uh, which eventually we found called the State of the Estate in 2012, um, printed by Her Majesty's Government in the May 2013, tells us that 99 million square feet is occupied. 99 million square feet of space is occupied by government. And it, it made me think, well, what do we actually pay for and what do we own uh, there? So if you take... Scotland's population as 8.4% of that. Um, it comes back to 4.3 million square feet in the calculation that we've made, which you know you can challenge because it's it's a rough calculation, um, because um, we've already got some government here. It means that we need that amount of space um, under full uh, fiscal autonomy. The cost uh, then you look at, and in, in a nutshell. Um, the cost of that uh, in Scotland would be, it's worked out on a very, very rough, but uh, we're not pushing the figures out. We're only putting £20 a square foot on it. Uh, it's a three times, it's, it's a third of what it costs in London. So the point I was making was, one, there's a huge stimulus, stimulus to the economy and the construction industry in, in particular. It's not a reason uh, to go for independence, but uh, there's a huge benefit in generating uh, construction work, property work, jobs, and what comes alongside of that, which is um, uh, housing and uh, 
services and uh, other things. And you know, it struck me that we some people haven't really thought about that in much yeah. depth. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. I've got one last question, if I can, from Mr. McCall, just before you have to, to fly off. Um, you sounded a bit like a reluctant yes voter because you were talking about how your you started off with your preferred model being uh, further devolution. If, if there was a substantial package of further devolution offered by the unionist parties, might you be tempted to vote for that instead of independence? Well, um, you know, I obviously I'd look at what I'm interested in is the fiscal powers. You know, I we heard Rupert Soames talking about uh, if you reduce the corporation tax rate, you have to put up something else. That's nonsense. I mean, the Irish tax corporation tax rate is 12.5%, and they take 40% more in absolute terms in corporation tax in Ireland today than we do here. So, um, you know, he obviously didn't do the Economics 101 course at, at uh, university. Um, and it's the same with the, the examples that Marie gave where, um, you know, if you reduce some taxes, you stimulate the economy and you actually take more tax in. So um, I, I would want to be able to vary those, you know, have, have those powers. And I would need to see what was on offer. And obviously, um, you know, if, the, if, if, if it's on offer, then fine. Okay. I would consider. OK, well, our next panel is here to discuss that very, that very issue. So, yeah. In the meantime, can I say thank you very much to all of you for coming along. It's been very helpful. I'm sorry we were so rushed, but we've got a lot to get through in this inquiry. And at this point, we'll have a short suspension. Thank you. Thank you.